HPPodcraft.com. Welcome to the bonus content for Strange Studies of Strange Stories. I am Chris Lackey. And I'm Chad Pfeiffer. We are still partially the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Uh, we're mid-transformation right now, which is very in theme for Werewolf Month. And we're going to talk werewolves a bit, but we're really going to break away from the topic and talk about storytelling in tabletop role-playing games for this bonus episode. And if we're talking role-playing games, we got to be talking to Ken Hyde. Yay! Now, Ken talks a lot about tabletop role-playing games on his own show, Ken and Robin talk about stuff. We wouldn't have started our uh, podcast if it weren't for your book, Tour to Lovecraft, which yes. came out prior to Aww, us starting it in 2009. That's to say. Yeah, back in those virginal podcast days. Mm -hmm. As we said, this is our bonus episode for February, but we're also sharing it on YouTube in March. Welcome, YouTube listeners. And we're doing that because Tour to Lovecraft hits store shelves March 22nd. So what, what can you tell us about that, Ken? This is uh, both volumes of Tour to Lovecraft. The original Tour to Lovecraft, the tales that you're so kind to say inspired you has been yes. expanded. No passive voice. I have expanded it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have added more uh, bits of Lovecraft, most of the collaborations and revisions, certainly all the major works, plus stuff about supernatural horror literature, some of the other nonfiction essays, something about cats, everyone's favorite. Yeah. A little bit about his poetry, Fungi from Yugath gets a look in, and just sort of plumped it up for another decade's worth of, of reading and research has gone into it. And then the companion volume, the new thing, is Tour de Lovecraft, The Destinations, which looks at Lovecraft's settings, his specific use what he says and does with Dunwich and Innsmouth and Arkham and Vermont and Oklahoma mm -hmm. and hyperspace yeah. and deep time and the moon and all the other uh, locations that are sort of part and parcel of Lovecraft. And I've always thought, and I think I've probably said this on this podcast many times, that Lovecraft, since he clearly cares nothing about character <laughs> and <laughs> his plots are secondary to his intentions of incident and affect his setting is really the main classical element of fiction hmm. that he has to rely on lots of people have asked where is arkham and i asked that as well but very few people have said what is arkham and i think that's sort of the job of tour lovecraft the destinations is to you know answer that for as many Lovecraft settings as I could jam into the book, which I think was about thirty or thirty-two. Well, it's a it's a great book. It's got a lot of wonderful content in there. Even though my favorite part is are the blurbs that are on the back of the book. That's oh yeah, I think that's I got the some best. Ace blurbs, right? I got uh, Nick Mamadis. I got Peter Cannon. Yeah, I got Leslie Klinger. Uh -huh. I got Tim Powers. Yeah, great. So many great blurbs. And yeah. And I was delighted to get a blurb from you, Chris. Aww. That made me happy. <laughs> On the topic for today, Chris and I, we've been throwing around the idea uh, of creating maybe a companion role-playing game for the show. Very early stages, just really knocking around the idea. Yeah. But we both love these things, and we thought maybe it could be based on some of the stories we cover or use those for source material. Playing on some of the tropes that seem to come up again and again as you study weird fiction. So you and Chris are steeped in these games. I'm more of a casual player. And when we were discussing talking about this on the show, I was saying, I enjoy dice throwing and leveling up and rule systems and whatnot, but for the real fun for me is when a unique story is collaboratively told. In other words, like there's a premise, but if that group of people weren't together playing this game, you would never have created some cool, unique moments that that you all did together where it's a whether it's a one shot or a campaign and i also love when people you know the characters change and there's some sense of closure the topic is storytelling in role-playing games you can talk about whatever that means to you but i guess we'd be discussing the running and the playing of the game as well as the design please use werewolves in your work <laughs> <laughs> just desperate to cling to relevance on werewolf month my first question to you is when you're writing a role-playing game coming up with a concept mm -hmm. for it. How do you factor in story structure and storytelling within the writing of the game itself? It depends on the game, first of all. Uh -huh. Some role-playing games, the field that is, you know, sort of generally known as story games mm -hmm. are role-playing games that are designed for a specific story or even sometimes in the new lyric game sense a specific effect at the table. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking of games like Dread, for example, or games that right. uh, even more tightly got uh, dogs in the vineyard that are meant to tell one specific sort of story. That's sort of the story game idea. And then at the far other end, there are your sort of Dungeons and Dragons or even more open space games that are just a bunch of resolution mechanics, maybe some monsters, 
-hmm. and some rules and it's well go do what you want you can get that slightly more specific you say oh here's a dungeon go through the dungeon here's a a castle de-haunt the castle whatever yeah and that moves you sort of into uh the sort of call of cthulhu space which is i'm sure what most of your listeners are at least passingly familiar with which is the attempt to basically replicate a lovecraftian story in a gaming space yeah. and it's not an exact word for word remake of uh say charles dexter ward or the ghost eater but um <laughs> <laughs> but I when wish. your uh players are presented with a necromancer raising up the dead or a werewolf ghost they respond ideally within the constraints of Lovecraftian fiction to create a Lovecraft feeling episode. That ideal varies player group to player group and keeper to keeper and scenario to scenario, but that's sort of the goal. Then I guess a little farther down that road, you have Trail of Cthulhu and other gumshoe games mm -hmm. that present a straight up mystery structure as the standard sort of game. Call of Cthulhu obviously offers that, and in the GM's advice, the keeper's advice, it says, structure your games like a mystery, but it doesn't provide specific structure mm -hmm. in the text of the game, whereas Trail of Cthulhu or the other gumshoe games do. Yeah. And that is, there's a hook, there's an anta a bad guy that did a bad thing. There is clues indicating the nature of the bad thing that you gather as you move through the scenes. Sometimes there's antagonist reactions. Sometimes there's hazards or other dangers. And then at the end, you've moved through enough of the of the investigation that you understand what's happening and you come to grips with that either in the form of a physical fight against werewolves or in the form <laughs> of a, a a monstrous realization that destroys you. And that is sort of the end point of that scenario or that adventure in a gumshoe game. And gumshoe offers, like I say, even more structure. So it's really a continuum from, sure. you know, your very narrowest, you are Mormon cowboys, you have to find out what's evil in this town. All these stories are judgment. This is what happens all the way out to I don't know. I got a plus two mace. Maybe there's some werewolves. Let's go smash them. <laughs> right. Yeah, I feel like that there is a spectrum. I, th I think this is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, in role-playing games, from one end of it is telling a story and the other end of it is simulationist gaming. You can simulate a story and that's one of Robin's great projects mm -hmm. is to simulate narrative concerns in the same way that, say, GURPS simulates physics or chemistry. Sure. Uh, the notion being that if you are a character in a story, genre tropes and narrative constraints are just as important to you and maybe even more important than does a bullet kill you, mm -hmm. right? And does a bullet kill you, I point out, is an important part of those genre tropes. Sure. I mean, you're building those in immediately when you say in any game, and virtually every game has this, uh, if you've suffered a serious blunt trauma, well, you should go to rehab for six months. Yeah, no sure. game does that, no, right? No. Um, what they do is they say, well, walk it off. You'll be fine. Yeah. You know, a day of bed rest at, at most. Um, or handy cleric. The choices to simulate, you know, as you say, drama as opposed to physics uh -huh. are already made. Yeah. What I feel like is maybe better than simulation is sort of story versus total freeform. Mm -hmm. uh, and not even freeform in the way that it's used. That's actually a terrible word. It's already yeah, uh, a I... term of art. But uh, story versus sandbox. The yeah. notion of you're just wandering around the universe having adventures. Some of them may make sense in retrospect or an emergent story may occur mm -hmm. as happens, for example, during a football game uh, where at the beginning, it's just people out there playing football. And by the end, you've done a narrative you've said oh yeah. this is the story of joe burrow's redemption of the city of cincinnati there we are that was the story of that football game even that though was it was the just story wow game. i watched that one ken yeah <laughs> i did that's amazing. You you cited the one football game I watched this year. <laughs> this was that's I mean, not true. I, I watched say, the I watched you know, the Rams if, game too. Well, you know, in if, LA. if you are if you are into um, uh, drama, this has definitely been the NFL championship series. These last two Sundays of football have been amazing. It's been crazy. I, I gave with some people, and one guy in my group in particular is I what I call a simulationist. He's the kind of guy that likes a world that's built and there are rules, and then you can do whatever you want within that world. So, mm -hmm. but what also that means is, is that if something happens, if you go into a bar and you start a fight with 20 guys, that those 20 guys could 
potentially either beat you up or kill you. And he likes that aspect of it. He likes that if you get into a fight, your characters may die. Whereas mm. on the other end of that spectrum, if it's the first bit in the story that you're telling and the character goes in and dies, I think that's a, a terrible story. It's not. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, you guys, what I've learned from this discussion so far is that there's some space for a like rehab role playing game where you're just <laughs> yeah, characters right. from other games recovering. I, I guarantee you that that game would sell on itch in the story game community where you are playing <laughs> the badly wounded, battered, traumatized players of other role-playing games going through physical and psychiatric therapy. Oh, what are you in for? Ah, uh, you know, I took on a werewolf with just a plus one mace. That was not wise. Wow. Bless you. Yeah. Bless you for bringing in the werewolves. I do what I can, man. Yeah, and, and that is, you know, that is one of the great questions at the table is to what extent is that outside the player contract, which is don't ruin the story we all obviously know is happening, even though we are playing in a sandbox universe where any story can happen. The subset of stories that are ruined by an instantaneous self-harming fight, <laughs> are, those are stories we didn't want to tell. Yeah. Leave that set of possible actions out of your calculation. And I think maybe younger players and players that are newer to the concept of this sort of freedom of sandbox play, mm -hmm. they want to do that. They want to pick fights in literally the first bar. They want to back sass the Assassin's course, Guild or, or yeah, do yeah. other things that are clearly dumb because <laughs> A, they can't do that in the real world, and B, they are attempting to explore what is this new art form that I'm doing in the same way that, you know, you start out learning to paint and you, yeah. you know, splash paint around and, and see what it all does before you can actually yeah. make either a picture of pretty flowers or, you know, express the inner torment of your soul, whichever direction you're going with this. Now, I remember there was a, and Chad, you were in this game, this was way back in high school, where we had some long-lived characters that we adored mm -hmm. and there was a Call Cthulhu adventure in which they went into a cave and a tomb was booby trapped to cause the cave to cave in. It killed the entire party. Were and you running that game? I ran that game, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And okay. I remember thinking, because uh, everybody was really sad. It just happened. Yeah. We we're like, oh, that that sucks. And me, as the GM, I was young, and this is like you said, yeah, you're, yeah. you're learning how to do these games. I thought, that sucked. Nobody's having fun here, but I did what the book said. This is what this this is how it's supposed to go. It's not until yeah. I was older that I realized, oh, that's terrible. Why would anybody write that into a game? That's not fun. <laughs> the, the sort of the hard core of simulationism, as you put it, yeah. is that no, going into a cave is often fatal and stupid, sure. especially in the Lovecraftian universe. Yeah. The notion that you are not writing a story that needs to make sense or be fun at the table, but mm -hmm. you are drawing a realistic picture of the world is one that I think a lot of people have a hard time getting away from because they're not sure what the art form is for. Yeah. Again, I feel like this is a big church. If people want to do pretty much anything at the table, short of leaping across the table and strangling each other, uh -huh. knock yourselves out if everyone's signed on. But I feel like the real potential of the game happens, as you say, with collaborative story. The GM has a part to play. Every player has a part to play. Everyone's building something. Everyone's bringing something. I do feel like emergent play happens an emergent story happens even out of sort of entirely random picaresque D and D style encounters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I feel like you can also, and pretty much every game I've done for the last little while has demonstrated that belief. You can also use this art form to create stories that are richer and more full of valuable incident than any other art form can do because of that literally collaborative nature. Yeah. But again, that does involve figuring out where the guardrails are and the yeah. and wh which caves are booby trapped and so don't go into them in the first <laughs> place. And again, I've been in games and run games and been part of groups that have had great fun with deadly universes that any act of exploration risks your instant destruction. That can be great fun, mm -hmm. but the story then is happening not to the characters, but entirely in the minds of the players. And their story is not, again, uh, somewhat like a Lovecraft story. It's not a story of individual characters succeeding or even doing anything that matters. The story <laughs> is a description of the hideous wallpaper of the universe sure. uh, to cross yeah. the streams from Lovecraft to <laughs> Gilman. <laughs> Much of, of, of Lovecraft is literally that kind of story is, oh no, There's every cave is booby-trapped. <laughs> Too bad, <laughs> including the cave you're stuck in. That is Lovecraft's message. And 
you can get a great deal of fun, and I think that there are games that sort of lean into that, your Warhammers and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, that lead into that as a as a method of painting the pessimistic universe. Certainly, Masks of Nerothotep, that classically kills off three quarters to seven eighths of the party, even in careful, intelligent play, oh, right? Because it's drawing that picture of the universe. Yeah. But if your notion of a story is uh, these are our characters and they have things happen to them and those things take meaning, take on meaning from those characters' reactions to them. That is harder to do if the characters keep being eaten by werewolves uh, 10 minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> pull, the werewolf, pull the werewolf back in. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, one thing that you guys raised and we don't have to get into it too much is like with the, the cave collapse. I'm pretty, I've only run games a few times, but I'm totally Machiavellian. Like if I didn't get a role I like, I would just lie to the players. So I don't know how fair you are about that stuff. <laughs> like there's an extent where if the player wants to be playing a different kind of game, you know, as you were saying, where they just want to screw around or fight people, I might let them do that or feel like they have that control and then steer it towards something I want anyway, which is really what, for me, I've been in some games where it didn't feel like there was a point. And I've been in games where there was some play that was definitely very free world, but eventually Eventually, it led towards something, and obviously, I really enjoyed the latter, where there's some some event. I find that there are there, there are issues in games that, to me, seem a little like issues with young writers, where they're very good at coming up with concept and characters, but where's it going, mm -hmm. and what is the cost of the characters getting what they want? Because there should be. I mean, that sort of seems to be what the story is. And back to those characters that Chris was describing, I think the reason we were so attached to them is because they'd lived through a lot of adventures, but they were very marked by that experience. Yeah. All of them were either a little insane or scarred up or had um, some phobias. And that was so interesting to me to have these characters change. And oftentimes I'll get into a game where it doesn't seem that it, the characters that people created, they're cool, but they don't have anything they really want. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they're very distractible, the players. You know, they'll jump into right. a bar fight or whatever the conflict is. And I get less interested in it because it just, I don't have to know what it is, but I like to feel like it's headed somewhere. And I guess that's why I was saying to Chris, story is so important to me. Yeah, to the extent that you, the designer, want to determine what happens at the table, mm -hmm. that's where you start erecting these guardrails or these guidelines or these signposts in the text of the game to mm -hmm. co-opt at least some portion of, let's call it futile play, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily unfun play, but sure. it, as mm -hmm. you say, it isn't going anywhere. The more important that kind of emergent story is to you, the designer, and then hopefully you can communicate to the would-be players that this is the kind of game they're playing and that if they want the stick your arm in the hole and see what happens game, they should go to a different game. Right. That one is at the truck stop. I pulled back a bloody stump every time. How does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and so the, uh, you know, the job of the designer is to present that possibility and create rules and structures that allow that to happen and then also right. communicate that very eloquently in terms of the game text and in terms of even the games the back cover text right. that you know yeah will clarify what kind of thing are you trying to do is this the game where you are trying to play lovecraft stories is this the kind of game where you are just going into some dungeons and hoping to find some dragons? Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of game where literally the symbol of the game is a hammer for killing you or other people? I guess a lot of conflict probably comes in with people jumping into games and everybody wants something different and nobody had that discussion. That's player conflict. I mean, certainly yeah. character conflict, everybody jumping in and wanting something different is very pregnant and interesting and fun play. Oh, that, I think for sure. If this is the maybe it's better yeah. for a one shot than it is for a campaign because uh, if you really wanted that, just shrugging your shoulders and saying, well, I guess my good buddy the cleric got it, let's have adventures, is also <laughs> unsatisfying. The difference between a game that is meant to replicate maybe the feeling of a short story or even a novel versus a game that is, or a movie, versus a game that is meant to be part of a series. The classic example, I guess, would be a superheroes game where, mm -hmm. sure, everyone's got their own agendas, but at the end of the day, you've got to take down, you know, Manwolf, clear up the streets of Gotham City or whoever. That's your real goal, even though you all have your own agendas uh, to make yourselves fun and colorful. Well, and I remember there was, this is a game I played with Chad as well. This was back in the early days in 91 when Vampire came out, Chad ran Vampire. Are you sure it wasn't Werewolf the Chad ran? It wasn't. It wasn't. It was 91. <laughs> it was. Werewolf wasn't out yet. All right. All right. There are werewolves in the game Vampire, you, though. Yes, absolutely. There are. They're, they're yeah. horrible, dangerous things, and you should not uh, mess with them. Exactly. Now, I remember how that game was different because we had conflicts between players, mm -hmm. where I remember there was this priest 
that had the true faith and the prince said, kill this priest because he's going to be a problem for us. My character was like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to just kill this guy. He's, he's a good guy. And Josh's character was like, no, we got to kill this guy. And I remember having that moment at the table, like, whoa, this is rad because both <laughs> of our characters want different things. And it's like, how far is this going to go? Or like, is my guy going to be willing to to fight this other guy in my group over this mm -hmm. thing. For me, who's the guy who played a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons and Marvel superheroes and Call Cthulhu, everybody's pretty much on the same page with everything. Mm -hmm. But having that character conflict that the players that we, you know, we weren't mad about. It. I remember being really excited by having that situation and it was different. And that's kind of more of the emergent storytelling that I think was happening in the early nineties. Yeah. Well, I like one shots for that reason though, you know, because people will turn on each other in the game. <laughs> You got to be somewhat harmonious if it's a campaign, right? But like sure. when you're doing something, you know it's for the night and somebody disagrees. All right, I'm shooting him. I mean, I've been in that situation. You guys are going to fight each other? Yep, let's do this. That's always fun. So how important, Ken, is it mm -hmm. in character creation that the characters can work together? And when you're writing a game, how do you factor that in to communicate to the, to the GM and the players that are going to play your game? Some games presume a goal. Fall of Delta Green, for example, presumes that you are going out to investigate some horrible mystery because the government told you to go investigate that horrible mystery mm -hmm. or your cell within the government if you're playing regular Delta Green. Yeah. The larger point is some more important person than you, the voice on the tape, gave you a problem, you should go solve it. Those are your goals. And there are lots of games that present that. Call of Cthulhu, of course, presents the implicit understanding of that as a goal right. in which, well, Cthulhu stuff exists. You should probably fight it. The reason, you know, obviously that Delta Green came about was because in many campaigns that didn't feel like enough of a push and you didn't really have a reason to go into the ninth haunted house to keep going into those caves. Uh -huh. Someone ordering you to do it becomes the answer. In Vampire, interestingly, you have constraints in or certainly in old school classic vampire and to the extent that i was able to move it back to that fifth edition vampire mm -hmm. when i designed it yeah, yeah. Uh, those constraints are imposed by the environment those werewolves will tear pieces out of you if you leave the city mm -hmm. the city is under the thumb of some elder vampire who forces you not to engage in straight up contests of magical power because that reveals vampires and breaks the sure, masquerade. Sure. Part of what made that play interesting to you, do I kill the priest, do I not kill the priest, is the knowledge that the prince said kill the priest, that the prince has established this pressure cooker mm -hmm. setting. Yeah, You can absolutely do that in, the, in, in a game and presenting characters with goals and natures and things like that is e as easy as asking at the beginning of the character design, what makes you go investigate Cthulhu mysteries versus yeah. literally not doing that? And yeah. that's the drive from Trail of Cthulhu. But you right. can write factions into the game the way that they did in Vampire, where your your goal is to hoard secrets if you're Nosferatu and find out magic if you're Tremere and uh, amass political power if you're Ventru and all the other things. And so, oh, I know what my goal is because my character does this. <laughs> Similar effect, although less focused comes even out of class characteristics in Dungeons and Dragons. My goal is to get better weapons because I'm a fighter. My goal is to learn more spells because I'm a wizard, etc. That sort of organic goal is fine, but I feel like, like you do, that it's more fun and interesting and more fertile story material if those goals are attached to something in the outside world, either a human being that you care about mm -hmm. or a human being that you hate or any number of possibilities that they create that. And that can either be a matter of the individual GM establishing that, uh, for example, or it can be in the game. For example, in Robin's Gay and Reach game, one of the character creation questions is, why does your character hate Quandos Vorn? Mm -hmm. And why did Quandos Vorn humiliatingly defeat you earlier? Those questions drive play in a huge way. And it's brilliant mm -hmm. game design from Robin. Dread has a similar question asking thing, you know, what's the thing you did at Sleepaway Camp that you'll never tell anyone? And, and that sort of psychological uh, spin-up motor Mm -hmm. in uh, character creation can be very fruitful in play. And again, the trade-off, uh, as I think we've come around and back to you, mm -hmm. is that you can do that in a in more intense, focused, brighter way in a story that is meant, as Chad says, to be a one-shot or a short story than you can necessarily afford to do in a game that's meant to continue at the same table with the same characters, basically, for months or even years. You're familiar with movie film story structure. Yeah. The idea of, I think a few role-playing games have attempted to 
do that, where they try to structure a session or a, a number of sessions like a movie, mm -hmm. where they have those beats, they have the first and second act, and mm -hmm. there's the midpoint. Is there something like that in most role-playing games? Is that something that you want to try and use as a guide? Or is that the, the nature of the role-playing game, is that it doesn't go to that kind of structure where you can have a scene where nothing really happens. It doesn't move the story forward. It doesn't move the characters forward in any way. It's just sort of a fun little scene. To say movies do those things is, I think, a disservice to the art of cinema. Um, we, I mean, we were literally just talking before we started recording about Licorice Pizza, which is full of scenes that don't move the story forward and yeah. don't tell you any more about the character than you already knew. They tell you the same thing, but they tell you in an interesting, fun, amusing, hangout light. Sure. Many, many, many movies do not, uh, you know, get shackled to the Sid Field uh, no. three-act model, but many, many, many game designers are and feel that they should be. You do see that, and I personally, and this is an aesthetic judgment, this is sure. not about can you design it. Obviously, people have designed games with rising action and Freitag's Triangle and the whole rest of it. Mm -hmm. I think that trying to ape other art forms in our art form is not necessarily the best practice. Mm -hmm. It can produce great things. Obviously, one of the great Call of Cthulhu uh, scenarios is Raid on Innsmouth, where you're literally just playing through the Raid on Innsmouth. Mm -hmm. However, lose what makes role-playing great if you're trying to be a movie in your head in the same way that you lose what makes a movie great if you're trying to be a play. Yeah. So I, I feel like there are absolutely games that have that story structure that say, mm -hmm. At the end of session three, your characters will now have a, a moment that changes their understanding of the world. Fiasco, of course, legendarily does that, sure. and it does it beautifully and brilliantly yeah. with the tilt moment where your uh -huh. whole understanding of the plot topples over on its head. But again, Fiasco is very deliberately trying to capture that Coen Brothers movie feel mm -hmm. yeah. in a way that other role-playing games necessarily aren't. And again, Fiasco is tuned for that one session play in a way that other role-playing games aren't. And so therefore, you can get away with tighter constraints, louder character choices, bigger stakes, because that time at the table is so short and you want to make sure that the story you tell does in fact have incident and is not just hangout moments that are fun at the time, but don't wind up doing anything. That's a really good insight, I guess, that when you come to this, as we're, we're talking about on you know very early stages of making a game, the first thing you do is compare it to other art forms. So it's really good to hear that because you're right, you wanna make sure that what you're really leveraging, I always think about this and this is the weirdest example, but I saw this pornographic comic book when I was very young. <laughs> and when I was, I was hanging young. out with my friend oh. Lyle Erickson and it was 32. two women and an alien and the alien was getting his tail into the action and it was very bizarre. He goes, well, that's great because they're exploiting the art form. You're not gonna see that in a filmed pornographic thing unless it's just, you know, that is exploit, that is using not. the art form to do something that you can only do in that art form. And it was a joke, mm -hmm. but it changed my understanding of things a little bit, that if you're not exploiting the art form that you're using, why are you doing it? And for role-playing games, that is that sandbox atmosphere and it's being able to play your character and own those choices and control the story. So that's actually great, Ken. That was really helpful to think about. I'm glad that that turned out helpful. It's just, you know, one of the things, and I think we're all, familiar enough with story and with story structure and even with film structure to know that there's a lot of things you can borrow from those things mm -hmm. and they certainly help with player buy-in being told we're playing a game that is like a coen brothers movie that helps a lot of people decide do i want to play fiasco how do i want to play fiasco mm -hmm. sure um being told this is a game like a lovecraft story that was yeah. giant to me in 1981 the notion that, oh, games can be about this instead of how many longbows can my half-elf carry. Sure. Mm -hmm. Vastly interesting to me. I'm not saying that you have to build everything de novo. Obviously, every art feeds off of every other art. Sure. But right. do try to be aware that some best practices, if your goal is to tell, as you say, a connected story that goes somewhere in which the characters grow and change, then you are going to need to borrow elements of narrative fiction, either film or prose, to make that happen because yeah. those are the tools that are developed to get that effect. And then you, the trick is always figuring out how can I use that tool from short stories in a role-playing game? How can I yeah, make yeah. it about 
the thing that role playing games do that nothing else does or that they do better than everything else. Right. And that is the ongoing job of game designers. And we're still doing it. Some of us have gotten scarily, scarily good at it, like Jason Morningstar, the aforementioned uh, fiasco designer. Mm -hmm. Some of us are, are plugging along OK. But I think that that's really the goal every time. And one of the great things about being part of an art form that is only 50 years old is that we're in the equivalent of cinema in the 1940s. There's lots of stuff still left undone oh, right. and undiscovered. Yeah. In many ways, we're a little more retrograde even than cinema in the 1940s was because, you know, until Emily Kerr Boss came along in the early 2000s, we'd never had our first screen kiss. Yeah. <laughs> so if you imagine right. that the first screen kiss happened sometime in 1932, you get a sense of what role-playing games are leaving on the table. And they're still leaving on the table in, in many cases. But that's one of the great things about being here pretty much at the creation of the art form is there's so many different ways to go with it. Right. You know, you're going to be thinking, oh, I wonder if this weird effect that I read in a Sheridan Le Fanu story can be done in at the table. And when you figure out it has, you're going to, you, you've invented that. You're a pioneer. Yeah. And that's, I think, more fun than being the 13,000 year uh, history of painting. Mm -hmm. Again, right. painting's great. <laughs> right. Say nothing against painters, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure someone did that already. <laughs> Oh, man. I'm going to level that against painters now. I mean, I sure? guess that's cool. Yeah. It wasn't 10,000 years old, Super Grandpa. Yeah, exactly. I'm doing role-playing games. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, well, art, I will baby. say, though, just to close the loop on what you said about how all of these art forms can influence the design of a game, gaming has influenced the way that I approach my writing. You know, I do character sheets for characters that I create for screenplays and things because it helps me ground them to know what they have in their pockets. Mm -hmm. And you, you were talking about character creation in World of Darkness when they introduced the system of merits and flaws. It really helped me think about character in a lot of ways because you're obviously going to take a merit because you're playing a role-playing game and you want these advantages. But the fact that you can't have it unless something negative is also a part of your story or your personality mm -hmm. is great yeah. because that really frequently is how you create a nuanced character. And frequently our merits are our flaws. You know, mm -hmm. the thing that you're rewarded for is something that actually also hurts you in other areas of your life. So that was in incredibly instructive to me. And I think that it's one of the reasons I would tell anybody to play a role playing game like football players doing ballet. This is yeah. going to help you <laughs> right. in your creative endeavors. Role playing games are an amazing art form in that, that it's, the participants are also the the creators and the observers. Yeah, right. You're the writers. You're everything. It's an event that happens and that is shared by the people that are participating in it, and then it's over. And you just have the memory of that moment or those moments and those characters and those times. I mean, now, of course, people record the role-playing games and... And show them to people. Some people are very famous. But I think that things like Critical Role, I never could get into it because... Part of the fun of the role playing game is the participation, is being in it. Just watching yeah. other people play a game for me has never been the draw. Even sports, I don't really like to watch sports, but I'll play sports because it's fun to to run around and throw a ball and to sort of get at that analogy. Mm -hmm. I think with sports, a lot of it is it's better to see something done really, really well. <laughs> sure, and yeah, so for sure. We can all throw a baseball, but we can't throw major league baseball. That sort of exalts you. And I think sure. a lot of people have that reaction to critical role. Maybe some of it is just generational. I mean, people our age grew up with this being a thing that you did in the basement, sure. and then you left, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And the notion that it is suddenly for spectators is going against decades of our DNA uh -huh. of this is not for spectators. <laughs> this is the opposite of for spectators. Matt Mercer, obviously a terrific GM and a great sure. voice actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so he presents it all. I don't want to say that he's the Mike Trout of role-playing games. I feel like I'm kind of a Mike Trout in my own little way. Sure. But he's better at being on stage than I am, mm -hmm. absolutely. And so to an extent, he's borrowing more of other art forms to make a hybrid art form that's half theater, half role-playing games. Yes. But Greg Stafford used to say that the only art form that was remotely like role-playing games was jazz. And that the purest moment of jazz is when it's just jazz musicians jamming. Mm. And that that's when they're the producer, they're the creator, they're the designer, they're the player, they're the audience, they're everything. Yes. And then they would go off and do their own thing. But that jam session was always in their minds and was always informing their later work. Yeah. And you would have, obviously people would pay to watch great jazz musicians jam together. Sure. That makes sense. To another extent, the people paying are people who can't do it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. very seldom 
is the audience of, of a jazz show as good at playing as the people on stage? And I feel like role playing uniquely because the actual physical act of doing it is so much easier than playing the clarinet or whatever, that divide, it, I mean, it's easier even to role play well than it is to throw a baseball well. Oh, yeah, of course. I, I, yeah. I mean, there's more Mike Trouts out there in <laughs> role playing than there are in baseball. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you know, I've played in some ga some groups that were really good with, like, I've been in groups with people who weren't great, but they played with other players who were really good. And then it changed the way they played because mm. they've been exposed to people who were maybe enjoying it in a different way or something. Right. So I can definitely see the benefit, as you're saying, of people who are just great at role-playing games and you watch them and you go, oh, we could be doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do think it's probably generational. I know yeah. it's generational, right? I mean, you look at it the is. numbers, the the audiences for these shows are the upcoming generations, the Gen Z players. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're not elderly Gen X types like myself mm -hmm. or even presentable millennials like you guys. Um, oh, I'm, but I'm they, Gen X. You're Gen X. <laughs> I'm still right, Gen X. Yeah, we're Gen uh, X. Come fine. on. Well, I, you know, and also I did want to say that it is possible, like, if you go to a play, you can interact with the people on stage. You just, yeah. the, it ends in, like, five minutes. They kick yeah, you out. They'll, they'll but you can out. do that yeah. if you want. I and mean, there are plays that encourage audience <laughs> interaction. I mean... Oh, even if it's not encouraged, I mean, you can just go up, get get on stage. <laughs> just get arrested a little. That's all right. If you hear that there's black box theater, they're saying, get on stage. So if you go see one of those, just for the audience to know. They want you to participate, even if they say, no, no, don't do it. That's part of the fun. <laughs> they have a stop word, which is a lengthy quote from Beckett. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You got to wait to hear that. Otherwise, <laughs> right. yeah. have fun. The constraints around design kind of are the constraints you want to build into the end experience, I guess, is the yeah. is the takeaway from a lot of this. Yeah. Deciding what kind of an end experience you want is the same thing as deciding what's this picture going to be when I start painting it or what's this movie going to be about when mm. I start writing it. Yeah. Right. It's just part of the art form. Well, Ken, thanks so much for coming on board here for this bonus episode. This has been great. You know so much about this stuff and it's just oh, awesome yeah. to listen to you. Giving us a lot and to Think uh, about. I hope folks will go out and get tour to Lovecraft. I hope they will too. And also I hope that they will keep an eye on that you guys are going to, we're not you just using this as a ridiculous hook to hang this promo piece on, but you guys think about it and try and make a game that draws on the whole corpus of, of Western weird fiction. Yeah. That would be kind of great. There's games that do it individually and it would be fascinating to see what happens with a game that deliberately st sets out and says we're the son of a, a thousand fathers and 700 mothers and we're out there <laughs> getting it done. <laughs> totally. Uh, and with that, I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Ken Height. And you've been listening to our bonus episode of H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast, also Strange Studies of Strange Stories. You can find us on hppodcraft.com hppodcraft.com <laughs>